Okay, hop in the coffin. Here we go! It doesn't take some super gamer gene to play Dark Souls. Mostly it's time and a lot of coffee. If you're watching this, you probably play a game, so I know you've heard it all before. Dark Souls is so hard. Dark Souls created the next great game genre. Dark Souls is the Dark Souls of Dark Souls. It's a series so massively memed and mythologized about, it can be hard to get a clear picture of the games. But at the k -Bash show, we like to cut through the bullshit uh. and make incisive points. And it's not gonna be easy. The series has coverage out the ass longer than the sum of its run times. So what's a YouTuber supposed to do? Give their perspective. That's it. It's all you can do. But that's the beauty of Souls games. They put the player on a pedestal and shower him with gold. Your playthrough hits most of the same beats of any other, but it's something you craft and earn and scream through. Oh no, come on! It's the kind of series you can share stories about, and that's true of other multiplayer games, but at least these turn into competent solo experiences offline, and sometimes it makes them better. It means you're not being relentlessly force-fed, quote, jokes, at every turn. <laughs> Try finger, but hole! <laughs> now this is part one of my long-form Dark Souls retrospective, funded by patrons. Thank you for letting me drink a lot of coffee. I would die a thousand times for you. And I did. Probably twice. With righteous motivation and a really big sword, I battered down every game almost completely solo, and I'll disclose which version I played in its respective segment. But for now, let's armor up, strap on our think brain caps, and get killing. They say that only wicked men seek fortune and fame in the very gravel of life's long road, but that was never my intention. Three months hence, the dark spirit came to me, whispering doom in my ear. Oh, another patron goal? K-Bash. No, we are not doing this shit again! Please! You are required to review the Dark Souls games. But I already wanted to do that! Or you will be cursed to undeath and eternal madness. Have you seen my show lately? Do you think that's a new life experience? Spare me your spirits and your high-minded gods. Speak not of greed or fame. It is the will of the people that drives me ever onward. Demon's Souls is a 2009 PS3 title from the studio that brought you most of the coolest games ever made. Lost Kingdoms, Otogi. It's actually kind of criminal it took this long to get proper recognition. I'm playing on the original version myself, not the PS5 remaster. But you know, if you've got a thousand bucks you'd like to donate, please, don't let me stop you. And now I get to sneer and pretend it's because I'm a gaming historian. Yes. Demon's Souls is kind of peak K-Bash core. It's why I love games and looking at series in full. What can I say? It's a high quality seventh console gen dark fantasy action RPG and the genuine origin point of an entire gaming subgenre. It's history. Jesus, what happened to my pants? And it's hard to imagine skipping the thing. Dark Souls itself may be a trilogy, but Demon's Souls is part of the mainline games, part of the lineage. It isn't an optional offering, it's a prototype, a blueprint of design sensibilities that were carried along and resonated going forward. Things once exclusive to Demon's Souls came back in later games. It's in the list for a reason. I cover a lot of uh, anime aesthetic games on the channel and all kinds of genres, but I like lots of things. My favorite aesthetic, though, my bread and butter is low-key dark fantasy, so medieval era technology, swords and shields, magic, but not too much, just a pinch, okay? Just a little pinch. Demon Souls is the coziest thing I've played all year. I know that sounds crazy, but hey, high-rise rooftops or astroturfed suburb, when you're home, you're home. I was excited to walk into hell, and I'm glad I did. Not doing much to dispel the masochist allegations. The player isn't fed a ton of context outright, but the Souls games like delivering info less directly than your average AAA title. Arguably, Demon Souls tells more than the later games. It intros with a trailer that invokes biblical language, you know, on the first day, etc. Only there's two days. Day one, people in souls. Day two, demons. Wow, that's rough. I bring this up because some people like to say the games are depressing, and they are, but it's worth noting that even in the game's opening cutscene, people precede evil. Hope is inherent to the soul's experience. Life sucks, but question mark? You create a character who 
Guys, come on, you can't make that the default. You create a character, select a class that determines how miserable or easy your intro will be, and a starting gift. Just a consumable that may or may not make things easier. I really like the burden of choice here. Appearance doesn't mean anything, but picking your starting weapon, your earliest stats, and something as small as a one-time consumable puts a lot of trust in the player. Treats them like a human. I can respect that, especially because if you grasp the basic mechanics, it's all trivial, but this early feels important. You're stepping into the world, but on your terms. Another cutscene hands the player a whole lot more than the first. The kingdom of Boletaria was a land made prosperous by the king via the power of souls. A strange fog rolls in and turns the nation upside down. Demons are walking out of the fog and driving men mad. World's gone crazy. Apparently, the king was meddling with powers beyond his control. It's a classic setup. Icarus did it, kind of. Babylon did it, kind of. Reaching too far and falling is an old story. What isn't is making the hero do the exact thing that led the king to ruin. Your entire purpose in Demon Souls is to do what no mere mortal can. Become extremely powerful by using the power of souls. Souls gathered by killing immensely powerful demons. And then topple the king. You're explicitly cast as the hero of the story. You're explicitly told to kill every last demon. You're the world's last hope. Alright, FromSoft, I see you roping my gamer ass in with the promise of big RPG number, obscene ultra murder, and a potentially compelling narrative payoff. It's okay. We can skip the drink. I hate going through the absolute basics, but I'm assuming some viewers are Souls babbies, so simplicity is at the heart of the Souls game's beauty. You're there, in 3D space, meandering around the world with some items in your pack, at least one weapon, and sometimes a shield. You don't use the face buttons to attack, your arms are accessed with the shoulder buttons. It's a neat feature, tacking two buttons onto each arm and leaving the interacting, stance changing, item handling, and dodge rolling to face buttons. It's an incredibly basic set of controls for something propped up as super difficult. It reminds me just vaguely enough of Chivalry and Soul Calibur 2 and Sam Show that way. Easy enough to grasp, but highly deadly. That's the kind of tension I can get lost in. Death always seconds away. Strangle Wink style. But for the most part, death's gonna be on you. Well, at least I know that snare now. The tutorial isn't exciting, but it does something I really like. The Souls games use vertical level design often, and the intro stage has a broken rampart you're meant to jump from. No guidance, fall damage exists, you just have to do it. And it's nothing really super basic, but informs the player about what to expect and trains them to engage without a pop-up, without a word. You're rewarded for splashing around in the kiddie pool with a thrashing so sound you're mulched in seconds. I think the visceral weight of your loss here, the total unfairness of the situation, makes people think that the cruelty is the point. I reject that. Yes, the game just beat me within an inch of my life after a clean tutorial run and rubbed the burning end of a cigarette into my forehead and spit on me and stepped on me. But the context matters. You're still the kingdom's only hope. You're gonna need more power to kill demons like that, and you're introduced immediately to a woman who can channel the power of souls into you for power-ups. It's just part of the tutorial. Dying is part of the game, so you lost some souls. Every enemy in the game ranges from a soul baggie to a soul pinata. Get boppin'. <laughs> Dying drops your souls like Sonic, but the rings stay. Unless you die on the return trip, then they're gone for good. Hey, no one said you can't run all the way through the level, ignoring everything in your path to snatch up your souls again. And every level you can pump into your character is permanent. Whatever souls you ferry back home to channel into yourself, nobody can touch those. The Souls games push choice from the very beginning, but soon after they push something much more powerful. Individual sovereignty, control of yourself and what you've earned. Purely in terms of mechanics, these are are not antagonistic games. They reward effort and cunning, make a monument of the player who persists. I mean, don't let me tell you that. On death, the game brings you to the Nexus, where you meet the aforementioned Soul Channeler and the long-running Souls community meme, the Crestfallen Warrior. These are the first two characters you meet in the same room. They're symbolic of the two paths, okay? Play the game and synthesize, consolidate, become, or be the guy who got filtered and tearfully posts about how it's not for them. It is with a heavy heart that I have personally deemed Demon Souls too hard. It's just not made for me, and that's okay. 
Can someone get this man a tissue? Demon Souls is dense with important information. I like skimming things, but it's hard when the very first level preceding the tutorial lays the groundwork for the remaining experience. So, you're dropped outside the castle, fight your way up to the gate, can't get in, and realize you have to find another way. You can pick up some items in the castle grounds, and climbing the nearby tower, then poking around, yields a couple of chains. You're not prompted at any point, but it seems logical that breaking the chains could help, so you do. Door opened. Problem solved. The first level is fascinating for a lot of reasons. The vertical and narrow level design forcing the player to not rely so heavily on their basic horizontal swings. The easily dispatched but erratic soldier enemies contrasting the much more imposing sword and board knights. The little pathway leading to a level inappropriate enemy who'll just send you to hell in a flash. Oh. No! No! The multiple explorable branches from the main path. The dragon! Man the dragon! There's a side path near a bridge that leads to a dragon horde. Treasures are visibly guarded by a pair of dragons, but if you take the main path, one of them audibly roars, flies over, and roasts the bridge if you linger. So you think, maybe I could hit the bridge, wait for the audio cue, lure the dragon over while running to the horde, and yes, yes you can. The shield is really good too, incidentally. And you're never told this stuff. It isn't mind-blowing, not really, but at a time when games were aggressively filling your HUD with notifications and breadcrumb trails and quest markers. It's such a cleanse living in the moment because you can die any moment inhabiting your character because every point you invest matters. Getting interested in the levels organically because the good stuff is everywhere and there's no waypoint. It even caps the very first section of the game off with a nice narrative tie-in. You only encounter humanoids and the two dragons, but as you get deeper into the level, you start finding these bizarre spear-wielding oozes like what? And if you weren't listening to the opening cutscenes, it's suddenly really obvious that some really messed up stuff is going on with the kingdom. The first boss isn't hard, but it's a pile of gross spear-chucking oozes. I mean, Miyazaki, what the hell? I want to move past the first level, but it's also worth discussing the aesthetic elements of Demon Souls. The Boletarian Palace is a washed out, austere environment, and that describes most of the other levels as well. If they're not cold and desolate, they're forlorn and gloomy. The absolute range on this bit. The atmosphere quite literally slides between barren and moody. That's about the full array of pathos on offer, excepting boss fights in general. I understand that actually affects some players who find it overly depressing but I really, really dig games focusing on combat in and around fortresses and battlements. Too much Kingdom of Heaven as a kid. Who knows? The levels also serve to highlight the sense of heroism the narrative wants to instill. Everyone else is demented deformed, or insane. Among the few people left unscathed by the horrors of the fog, you alone can wield a weapon, resist insanity, and continue to grow, even thrive in a world that's almost entirely hostile. That's true of almost every NPC you meet, by the way. The Demon Souls supporting cast isn't particularly expensive or fleshed out, but they're almost all the exact people who'd still be alive in this hell world. And it's not all hyper-bleak dark fantasy stuff. Sometimes there's flaming salamanders. Just some funny little guys. The music sometimes fits the mood flawlessly. A lot of the time, the game is totally silent, but the boss fights make use of almost grating bombast, really booming tracks. It's all acceptable, and it's hard to nail the vibe of something on a first pass. I like to think that the intro movie song, you know, became the cleric beast theme in Bloodborne. personal headcanon there. Regardless, outside of boss fights, the audio design, the music, isn't cueing you into combat like Assassin's Creed or Fable do. You can be stalked off-camera and not realize until it's too late. I imagine that's contentious for some people, but enemies make noises just like you. And frankly, the Souls games demand a level of alertness that often renders enemy surprise attacks powerless if the game is working. When you get sucked in, the only thing pushing you out is something too difficult. I think it's a clever an intentional choice, utilizing the negative space created by removing music as part of the greater web of immersive design. That was a lot of words. You know what's not? Explaining where to go next. That can be a real issue in later games. You're not often guided directly by the level design until Dark Souls 2, and you can still waltz into high-powered areas regardless. They'll let you hop from the Shire to Mordor if you go out of your way. But in Demon's Souls, you're dropped into the hub, the Nexus, and given a series of teleportation stones to browse. Each segment of the various worlds is given a number code. 1-1. One, one. 
one, two, etc. And you figure out pretty quick that you're always capable of handling the level one version of each world, and you should complete them in that order, basically. There's a few stipulations, but they're mostly irrelevant, like getting to finger each pie before- That is not- how I should have said that. And yeah, at this time, the bonfire system of Modern Souls wasn't a thing. Demon Souls gives very specific checkpoints and asks the player to actively engage with the world almost all of the time. You might think that makes the game harder than later titles, and some levels definitely suffer from overlong corpse runs, but this early entry is actually one of the most forgiving. I mean, it's patting your ass and telling you where to go. You're the hero! Goo goo gaga! I can't even joke about that stuff. At the baseline, Souls games demand more from the player than most. It's part of the allure, but Demons is kinder. The levels in Souls games are interesting, aesthetically, structurally, narratively as well. There's a lot going on in such a simple game. This discussion in particular opens up massively in the Dark Souls trilogy, so let's lay the groundwork. You load into levels without much direction or purpose because those things are understood. Your goal is to get strong and kill demons, exactly what the game already told you. The demons are all in in front of you, the path is laid bare, and the world isn't interconnected like other Souls games. It's video gamey in a way that the rest of the series isn't. While the world isn't as majestic, or grand, because it's trying to play like Mario. It feels a lot better choosing to disengage from the world tactically. Scenario, you're a new Souls player and you're running through the game, but it's really, really hard. You keep dying and losing souls because you forget to bank them and get cocky. You meticulously clean every area of enemies on the way to your souls-laden corpse and routinely have trouble doing so. You're low on healing items and the game feels impossible. Only, nobody said you had to engage. Right? I feel like the biggest stumbling block for New Souls players is pride, ego, assuming that the player is meant to deal with every obstacle honestly. It's okay, sweetie, as long as she says it's enough, it's enough. If the game wanted you to clear every room, you'd be locked in at the start of combat like DMC. But that's not what happens. You're allowed to engage and disengage at your leisure, and it's a necessary skill to develop early. Yeah, it runs contrary to the player's stated purpose, kill every last demon. Yes, it makes it feel like a video game and breaks immersion slightly, but you notice that when you die, every enemy except the bosses comes back. Maybe there's more to your purpose than being a tool in an endless war. Maybe you need to focus on what really matters, using the levels to empower yourself and killing the bosses. That's the real design intention for the player, and it's all conveyed passively. You can't possibly keep killing meaningless throwaway demons. The world is f burning. Get a move on. If that weren't the case, the game would throw screaming peasants into the streets for quick hero points. But instead, you're met with stark, barren worlds inundated with hostile enemies and the occasional unreliable NPC. So grab what you can and go. One mildly important thing I've neglected is the penalty for death. Losing half your HP until you restore yourself with a consumable item. Kind of a big deal. Only the game undercuts that traumatic punishment very early. Anyone who goes digging in the levels, and you'll definitely feel compelled to, ends up finding the Kling Ring, which reduces the soul form HP penalty to 75% of max HP. Makes the game so much easier, and it's found in a mild branch from the main path in the very first level. Actually, a lot of the game is like that. Every time I face something that was ridiculous, felt overwhelming and badly designed, namely the flying manta rays in the Shrine of Storms, some item existed that completely erased the misery. You can pick up the Thief Ring in the first level as well, and it stops the Manta Rays from skewering you at range, for the most part. Really helpful on obnoxious cliffside treks. The infamous Poison Swamp was awful until I equipped some items that slowly regen health, and it turned the level upside down. Completely positive experience afterwards. And that's janky and gamey, especially because those things are all missable. But like I said, Demon Souls rewards persistence, player engagement massively. As for distrust, the game is pretty clear about everyone being driven mad by the hunt for souls in the fog, but occasionally you'll meet a decent person, or more frustratingly, not have access to the one sane person you meet until you find a key in another level. The game doesn't make connecting with others easy. It's worth noting that several characters have hidden side quests you'd likely never get through on your own. This review doesn't account for the online era of souls writ large, something I mostly missed out on, but in those days, players could ruin each other's days by invading each other's worlds, choose to be temporarily helpful, leave messages cobbled together from a word list provided by the game. It's fascinating because these things, taken in some, cast the world of souls as fundamentally untrustworthy. Another 
player could be friendly or ill-intentioned, but you'll never know unless you interact enough to find out. I genuinely can't think of a game that sums up all the yeah. shitty parts of humanity better. It's actually art, a perfect summary told in systems. And in case you're not online, the game makes this idea real apparent with two NPCs. One, sitting above a boss room, will straight up lie to you that he's doing nothing and should be left alone. If you leave him alone, he resurrects the boss in the next room forever. Okay, it says here that this guy actually resurrects the boss forever. Let the record show that this man can suck my ch- It's actually kind of funny, in a sick way. Then Yurt, the silent chief, one of the heroes mentioned in the first major cutscene, is locked in a cage and asks to be let out. If you let him out freely, because he's a hero, he'll kill the NPCs in the Nexus one by one because he's also a murderer. That's your reward for being kind. Now I played Bloodborne years before this and have worked with human beings, so needless to say, I trust no one. I don't feel bad stopping to look these things up. It's part of the experience and something you learn by tapping into the creator's vision. Like when people say trust is the hardest thing to earn back, they're not joking. I remember what you did to my chapel friends, Miyazaki. I'll never forget. Other than items and the occasional person, you're mostly left with combat in the levels. I mean, structure matters too. It's directly related to combat. I love the dingy, scrappy environments, you know, the little raised sections, the ramparts, the stair sections, the tight corridors, every set piece that recontextualizes battle. Yes, some of the levels have other stuff going on, like the light platforming for items. <laughs> But it's not super sophisticated overall. So combat. Enemies start quaint and get progressively bizarre and dangerous as the game unfolds, and that's expected. It's foreshadowed in the first level, but seriously, the rolling skeletons of the Storm Shrine, whatever's going on in the swamp with these things and those freaks from the tower. Oh yeah, stun attacks are fun. Yeah. Okay. Okay, am I seriously just like locked forever in this? Can this enemy just stunlock you? I'm throwing this on YouTube, they get, they're gonna- WHAT ARE YOU CALLING- Many enemies are lethal, and even when they're not, the game is absolutely going to throw eight of whatever at you to make sure your life is hard. And that makes sense, the world is cruel, life sucks, but like you'd expect, engaging cautiously, at a distance, or not at all, makes things a breeze. Just remember you're not a superhero and you'll be fine. It's a slow, methodical system that rewards patience, awareness, deliberate action and quick decision making. And it's hard to make sweeping statements about because your build dictates your playthrough. A sword and board soldier will play completely alien compared to a mage and it will impact the experience. Some enemies become trivial, some bosses turn miserable. Some segments that you can blow through with a good stabbing weapon or a ranged attack become unbearable with a sweeping weapon. It's a system with so many minute variables that it resists critique from single playthrough people. But certain fundamentals are always relevant. Anyone can use at least a basic shield, and blocking goes a long way to keeping your skin on. Dodge rolling is extremely effective, but only if you're not over encumbered, leading to the infamous fat roll. Souls are important, but arguably more important is upgrading your weapon frequently to boost damage potential, as is sticking to one or two weapons only to ensure you have enough upgrade materials to get through the game. So while respecting the system is important, player choice is at the forefront. That bit I made about sovereignty earlier. Every soul level is permanent, and doubly so because there aren't any respec options. Yeah, no redo. You're stuck with your choices. Enjoy your BA in theater. I I can't talk, I have a BA in English. It's not much different than something like Diablo's older games, but in 2009, it's a weird piece of design anachronism. Even Diablo 2 hands you a free redo once per playthrough. It could have thrown you a bone, but they didn't. Jesus Christ, guy, I'm just asking for a little more. Okay. The build. The Souls games make a point of making you distrust NPCs, making side quests inaccessible, hiding design trivializing items, and making level ups permanent. You'll often hit a lull early on after a few quick wins when the difficulty suddenly spikes and you're not sure what to do with your character. You could rely on online folks for some of those NPC and side quest things, but not for your build. At this point, you either put the game down or reclaim your playthrough, generally by going online and figuring out what you're gonna end up as. It's hard to feel bad about after Yurt slaughtered all your NPC friends, and hey, internet age game, they knew what they were doing. For Demon Souls, I went strength, faith. I was going to end up with a blessed claymore, but settled for the slug-infested Sword of Moonlight. What? 
You generally want to level up your health in one attacking stat from strength, dexterity, intelligence, and faith, and then hybridize in some way. One of the most common builds is quality, so strength and dexterity, which gives you access to most armor, most weapons, good shields, and a ranged option with bows. It's a good strat. Builds really are the spice of the game, where the levels can get boring or repetitive, especially when you've seen them a few times. Who you are and how you interact with it all is the real story of play. By the end, I was wearing the armor of the traitor I saw out. Well, Wielding a sword that cuts through guarding enemies and hauling around a shield that healed me over time. It's not the strongest build, but it do work. It do work. The trouble with the builds is, once you've built yours, you don't need to bother looking around levels anymore. You know, I don't need the great staff of Guibus the Grandiloquent. Found in level 3-3, my weapon is fine. There's a triumph of design in that, though. It means finding a path, a purpose, can do what the design already encourages. Getting what you need and rising above what's immediately in front of you, and focusing on the real threat the bosses. What stands out about Demon Souls bosses, at least compared to other games, is how many are just downright curb stomps. Phalanx teaches the player not to tunnel vision too hard on a single enemy, to play gorilla style, but it's an easy fight. The Tower Knight reinforces the players have to clean their plate before eating dessert, i.e. clear the archers and take out the boss. He's so slow and telegraphed it's actually funny. The Armor Spider breathes fire, surprisingly, but with the right gear you can effectively tank through the flames and put it down no problem. The Adjudicator is one of the absolute weakest bosses in the series if you just walk up and hug ass. Many of the battles highlight the importance of playing defensively, like the Adjudicator and the Tower Knight are simple if you can just make use of decently timed dodge rolls. The old king, who meanders around blindly, can hurt you badly, but only if you go in swinging. Mindfulness matters. Otherwise, a couple of the bosses teach the player about staying mobile. The Maneater is a duo of gargoyles that will destroy you if you stay put and get careless, but effective movement should make it easier than not, and the Leechmonger is simple, but only if you take advantage to the stage, moving around to dodge its slow attacks and punishing when he's open. You'll notice that most of these are battles of environmental mastery. No worries, I watched Yu-Gi-Oh! and I remember Catapult Turtle hammering Castle of Dark Illusions flotation disc, okay? This is baby stuff. The game even introduces the first gimmick boss fight, where you'll equip a specific weapon to take the thing down all cinematic-like, and the Dragon God that takes surviving a small navigation segment to finish off. Both of these would become serious traditions. I need to mention healing items here, because Demon Souls is different than the other games, and most similar to Bloodborne, with its farmables. Yeah, I know all about consumable grass. <laughs> I have never done drugs. I live a life of cold order. You can only consistently heal with magic and consumable grass, and you absolutely can find a farming spot and stockpile weed to crush any fight in the game. Only takes time. I actually like the grass system a lot. It sucks when you're low and farming is lame, that's true, but if you need it and farm it, it's a reliable option to brute force any fight. Still, I like most of the bosses for existing with intention, making a point of something in particular, but they aren't the fights you remember. People remember the total packages, the ones that combine speed, range, and tight dodge windows. The ones that aren't gimmicks or tests of particular skills, but rather your skills in some. The ones that were hard. The Flame Lurker, the the Penetrator, Maiden Estrella, and the final boss, all of these require a good weapon and a refined understanding of the game's mechanics. You'll get hard filtered by the Flame Lurker if you're not stocked up with healing items. Don't pay attention to animation and audio cues, and don't dodge and punish fast and hard. That's true of the Penetrator as well, but the Maiden fight is even more bizarre. Taking place in a player-hostile environment with a deadly poison floor full of babies that'll stun lock you, have I gotten so desensitized that I'm not even reacting to a pond of blood babies. The only other path requires facing down another player type enemy who's armored up. While these fights can be trivial with certain strategies, they all feel more official for calling on player mastery. One major mechanic I've avoided is world tendency. The game's worlds become progressively crummier if you do bad things, and slightly better if you do good things. Like enemies will actually get stronger if you're bad. It's kind of on the nose, narratively. Good for challenge runs, you probably won't impact your playthrough much if you're offline. I played solo and didn't think twice, but I like that FromSoft, in this title, is pushing the heroic angle hardest. It's clear that this world, of all worlds, could use a hero. Anyway, you'll eventually confront the king, the source of decay in the land, a person cast in pure white brimming with power, only to kill him. 
and realize the game isn't finished, you still have to end the game. Decide the fate of the world only you could save. You're led to the husk of Alant, the true body of the king. Turns out you just fought a shadow, a replica. Alant tries to reason with you, but any player who's been paying attention knows not to trust what they hear. Demon Souls has two endings, and the only real good ending requires putting the old god back to sleep peacefully. It's a quiet finish, something like an epilogue segment of gameplay after the peak of the final boss. It's that, or become a lot yourself and hasten the end of the world. I'd argue there's hardly anything of value in that ending. Ending society, ending everything, makes sense in a vacuum. People are untrustworthy or warped beyond humanity. The world is gripped in madness, but you have to remember that this game features only a fraction of the greater world, a single kingdom. You could extrapolate that all people are fundamentally villainous and parasitic and absolutely deserving of eradication and generally inhabit a world of endless strife. But all I'm saying is, that's like most villains' motives from Final Fantasy, and it's getting a bit old. The world can be okay sometimes, alright? Get some boba, eat a burger, go for a walk, pop the Jurgens. If you can get to the end of a video game, one that's touted as unbelievably punishing, and do it your way, with your little patchwork tapestry tale to tuck away in your mind, you know, you can make things work. I love that about the Souls series. They're not all darkness and nihilism. They want to believe in something. The soil is rich here, fertile still in its years. Whether churned by storm or flattened by leather, it blooms. That is the strength I aspire to, but... Wow, really? You abused the Moonlight Breadsword and the Adjudicator Shield? What? Okay, it's all stuff you can find in-game. I mean, you could have done it naked with a dagger, or like... Learn to parry. What is this negativity? What- What are you, some kind of dark soul? I wonder if I still have the fortitude. And we've only just begun. So, Dark Souls 1, the internet age meme supreme, the founding of a franchise, and the rise of the Git Goodman. Get no, good. Get good. It's coming. Get good. Somebody Get good. Help me. It's a unique title in the series, still relevant now. Sales aren't the most important part of discussion, but Demon Souls capped out around 2 mil on first pass, and though we don't have clear numbers, Dark Souls sold several times that. It's a significant game, the first cross platform Souls experience, a refined reimagining and expansion of the design sensibilities and artistic direction conjured by the original. It's kind of a big deal. And it's all those things without changing the basics. You're still a guy, the world is still f oh. and you still wander around barren, dying environments while the raggediest things yet conceived pummel you into oblivion. But the name makes it clear. This isn't Demon Souls. This is the start of something new. And it's hard, like you'd expect. I just kind of reject that framing of the early games in the series. You know what's actually hard? Cooking when you don't want to, okay? Doing your taxes. Waking up at 5 a.m. for minimum wage. I'm just saying. Maybe we can drop the super hardcore gamer pretense. It's just time. It's time. Stop jerking off about how much time you have. It released in 2011, just shy of two years after the first. I'm on the PS3 version here. At first, I intended to play the original versions of each game to really trace the lineage. But after Blight Town, I played whatever was most accessible. And we're in the internet age. Anyway, the era of post-launch patches. Sekiro and Elden Ring are very different games since release, and that's wild considering how new Elden Ring is. Character creation's nothing special. I played the first. I know the score. But the starting gift selection includes an effective speedrun item, granting access to areas much deadlier than the player is meant to handle far earlier in progression. Nod to the devs. That's some good-ass design. Dark Souls 1 picks up and runs with the base aesthetics of Demon Souls. The setting is medieval fantasy, but magic feels more normalized. We see it in the opening movie that details the shorthand history of this new setting, the various factions that came together in the world to destroy the dragons with powerful magic, and some words about the accursed Dark Sign. That's about it. Dark Souls isn't interested in telling you its story. It's extremely interested in letting you figure it out for yourself. I hope you like reading text boxes. What's the Dark Sign? How does it work? Why does my character look like a zombie at the start of the game. Ew! What happened to Gwyn, Nito, the witch, and Seath? It's a world immediately laced with mystery that goes beyond the original. Demon Souls said, the world is dying, here's the guy who did it, get really strong. Dark Souls said, world's dying, you'll wake up in a cell. 
Fair enough. The tutorial stage provides character motivation for nerds, like I needed contextualizing, dude. I love slashing. So this dying guy tells us that hollows, us, I guess, undead people, are destined for greatness or something. Go somewhere. So we do. The one element that stands out about the tutorial is the plunging attack bit, something that wasn't possible before. It's just a falling aerial attack, not super important, which is why I inexplicably messed it up here, but it's good of FromSoft to acknowledge the verticality of their level design and its relevance in combat. The most immediately striking thing about one, though, is the aesthetic shift, the flavor of the world. Demon Souls was flat, dingy, very rarely colorful. The colorful bits were the magic, and they often populated later areas. That is a glowing slug? Dark Souls, however, gives the player a serene emerald hub watched over by a giant crow. It recreates the unnecessary verticality of the nexus, adds multiple adjoining areas, places to poke around, there's even optional platforming. But it gives the player no teleportation stones or storage, just a bonfire and the crestfallen guy. I'm gonna get back at FromSoft when I finish up my Dark Souls is garbage and here's why video. Dude, yes, that sounds like a great YouTube video, yeah. So it's still Demon Souls, only the world is vast, open, interconnected, much more lush and colorful. You have no proper home, only the glow of the bonfire is truly safe. That's not an exaggeration, you can be killed just a short walk away, you know. Dark Souls ain't playing. If you died in the tutorial, you learned an important lesson. Dying doesn't have any meaningful penalty. Immediately. Stats-wise, I mean, no health cuts this time. You progressively turn ugly as sin, but that's immaterial. There are no influencers in this world. And sure, you lose access to multiplayer features until you restore your humanity through a consumable but nobody's playing PS3 Dark Souls on a weekday, so I journey alone. Otherwise, increased amounts of humanity can provide relatively meaningful benefits, but that's nerdy and doesn't affect the average player experience, so... <laughs> Look, the devs even gave the player an upgradable, limited-use, refillable healing item, the Estus Flask. Quite literally the glue that holds the combat together, keeping the player moving forward. In short, they banned weed, farming and force the player to engage at least a little with boss mechanics. Elegant little solution. Okay, Miyazaki, give us a twirl. What's important though is the game seems nicer, right? It's patting your forehead, it's caressing your face, but head on up to the first level, Undead Berg, and well, it's fine, but word of advice. When you travel abroad, go down to the bank and take out some local currency, else you find yourself <laughs> around in a find-out economy. I actually love the Undead Berg in most level ones in Souls games. They're usually densely packed castles or city streets full of considered playground-esque design. They're just fun. But holy mother, the base enemies in this game hit hard and fast. Enemies in Demon Souls are lethargic, drained by comparison. See, they knew the player wasn't getting punished for dying anymore, and probably learned a lot about how forgiving basic enemies could be. So they notched everything up and bundled them up. You'll get destroyed screwing around in the undead bird. All Bloodborne combat discussion starts with an acknowledgement that Dark Souls could be passive and way too often for combat to be truly exhilarating. And that's not a meme. It's a behavior taught and rewarded by the game design. You can reveal a lot about the design of something just by asking what the designers reward. And yeah, drawing up a shield and playing passive goes a long way in Dark Souls. In fact, I sat there in stark disbelief about the difficulty of the first big level compared to what Demon Souls was in some. You know what? All Souls games are bullshit. Uh. That's just the truth. They'll throw all kinds of stupid crap at you, but it's usually a matter of dodge rolling in time or swerving fast, basically having a grasp on movement controls to punch through. But the jump to Dark Souls was a jump in pace. The world's inhabitants aren't just picking flowers and doing their chores. They're waiting for you with running shoes and you're gonna die. F this game! F this game! Sometimes it takes another cup of coffee, or a pig helmet, or going insane. The first time you get Souls games really is the turning point. It's what stops you from tearing up online and getting schmad. For me, years ago, it was Bloodborne, six hours in. That's how long it took to make it make sense. Dark Souls 1 took until the Bell Gargoyles. After upgrading my little longsword as much as I could and minding my surroundings, dodging in rhythm, felling the boss, and gazing out at that hopeful sky, I got it. Normally, I wouldn't bother highlighting something as small as this skybox and play experience, because really, 
who cares? But even a cursory glance at the achievement percentages shows an extremely steep drop-off between simply arriving in Lordran and actually ringing the first bell immediately after killing the gargoyles. The undead Berg, the Taurus Demon, and the gargoyles combined are a genuine player filter of nearly 20%. I guess it's a trade-off. Rewarding misery means an invested remainder. I want to take a minute to talk builds again. Um, please forgive me for not doing a full rundown of what each individual stat does. Like, intelligence makes your brain big, and faith makes you believe more in God. I was watching a critique of another video game, and the guy had to rattle off what, like, the health stat did and every other one too. And I'm sitting there like, cool, but I played Pokemon at 7 and Dragon Quest at 8. I actually play games? No, no, you're right, YouTube man. Someone out there surely doesn't know about hit points. <sighs> I played every Souls game, so I experimented with something new in every game. At first I wanted a fancy weapon and some powers, but that ended up feeling cheesy with passive health regen and bypassing the enemy's guard option with my sword. It meant I could safely ignore some of the challenging design, turn my brain off, disengage. But this is Dark Souls. Even if the evergreen get good has, in its overuse, become as cliche as an arrow to the knee or any other stale meme, I wanted to get good. I'm reviewing all the games. Of course I want to exhibit at least mild competence. So some commenter dipshit doesn't pop off about how I didn't really complete the game because I didn't run the thing naked six times or whatever you weirdos get up to. To be fair, you'll get that response no matter what you do. Some people are broken and whatever game they're playing is the only thing holding them to together. They are not your problem. Their bloodline is weak and they will not leave a mark on history. Anyway, I thought it'd be real cool to run the whole game with the basic longsword and a shield to parry attacks. A real low-key soldier type. Two problems. Turns out the basic longsword's actually really good, like Swiss army knife good. And second, parrying in Dark Souls can burn in hell. Scenario, you're actually trying to complete the game on a schedule. You go to parry anyone, and take a hit. You try this three times and die. Why would you ever bother parrying? You know what works better than parry 99% of the time? Baiting an attack and punishing. Not a problem. I play Ganondorf. Without exception, by the way, even shielding and punishing is better. There's no risk. The number of times it makes sense to parry over every other option is zero. So it's a style choice for people who don't mind learning the frame data of every single parryable attack in the game, not accounting for things that can't be parried and other jank. You know what, don't let me start ranting. Demon Souls had parries too, but it took till Bloodborne to actually onboard the general player base, so... I mean, it speaks for itself. Combat in Dark Souls, though, isn't purely reactive, boring, passive, whatever else it gets called. It's also about seizing the moment, being proactive when you need to. That's a common thing people gloss. Yes, you can throw your shield up and strafe around enemies fishing for backstabs, but you definitely can't do that with every enemy. Yes, you can just stay out of range and move in with your big forward swing to punish, but sometimes the environment is too cramped, dotted with pillars, swarming with enemies. It's not purely passive. Situational awareness is really what makes these games exciting that the devs need only place an extra enemy here or there, or even something as simple as a pillar in the room to completely warp the dynamic of combat. Hey, maybe they can take a page out of Brawl's notebook and add tripping too. No, no. It often plays with vertical segments to add flavor and texture to battle, destructible objects for visual flair and the occasional ambush, even floor hazards. Some enemies create poison clouds or breathe other status ailments that force the player out. None of this stuff implies passivity. If anything, it flavors the combat as Gorilla, hit and run, cunning first, damage second. That's important too. I think in a game borrowing so heavily from Western everything, it only makes sense to have combat lionize the player willing to become the Greek hero, right? The one who wins with wit above raw brawn. Most of the early boss fights are like that too. You can trick the Taurus demon off the rampart if you're careful. The gargoyles are hardly as ungable as other solo dudes, and the Capra demon, man, I don't know how you beat that guy without six moves and chucking an alluring skull to pull the dogs off you. What a shitty fight. I mean, really. And I've been killed by the guys waiting outside the boss room. And I've been killed on the corpse run, erasing all reward for victory. Thinking back on it, lots of the game rewards clever player behavior over raw skill. One of the only genuine level grinding spots in the game asks the player to pull aggro, run back, and crouch to abuse the AI into ledge jumping. And just before Blighttown, there's these crazy strong enemies, like three of them, and you can lure them to hilarious falling deaths as well because they're like really hard that early. Man, I wanted to get good 
but all it did was get mean. But that's Dark Souls. The game doesn't care if you're having fun. It's actually good and virtuous that I'm ignoring the levels and running straight to the bosses sometimes. The ends justify the means. Like I said in the previous section, you've got to reclaim your playthrough. Whether that means looking stuff up, cheesing bosses, glossing levels, I don't care. You can do what you want with your personal property, and I won't hear another word about it. I will say, Dark Souls doesn't totally sweep the first game. Sure, it's got some brilliant elements. The interconnected world and eventual light fast travel make the player very intimate with the map. In a way, I'm not with Demon's Souls, but issues arise because of that, like not having any direction, knowing where to go. That makes the world more believable. The player should be allowed to get in over their head, especially early on. But the game branches in some strange ways down the line. It's not clean cut like Demon's Souls, and it leads to a strange tension where, if you get stuck on anything at all, you'll wonder if you're even supposed to be where you are. Case in point, Blight Town, or uh, as I like to call it, 5FPS Town. That's a fun place. I don't know anyone who's questioning this neighborhood. It's a pretty cool place to be. Property tax is cheaper in dirt and the views are amazing. Everybody loves Blight Town. Oh my god. Y'all ever play this game? Remember the first time you got petrified? That was fun, like having your HP fully cut in half forever until you trekked all the way back up to the bell tower and bought the cure at a point in the game with no fast travel? I'm serious, casual Souls fans? Just play the original. Imagine getting to the Tomb of Giants having never found a light source. Just playing it raw. Couldn't be me! How about those ghosts everywhere in New Londo that you can't even interact with unless you're cursed yourself? Which generally means using a consumable with a time limit to fight them at all. Remember the first time you fell into the bottomless lake pit trying to fight the Hydra? No? Is that just me? Remember the invisible bridges in the crystal cave? Oh, please, centipede demon. Push me into the lava again by turning. Oh, yes! The whole game feels like it's held together with toothpicks and glue, ready to fall apart in a second. It's kind of crazy how lauded the game is. Demon Souls is simple, flawed, sure, but solid. Dark Souls is a chaotic fucking mess. Maybe that's why people like it so much. I certainly don't dislike the game, but I'm remembering why I'm not as jazzed by the thing. Jank is important for Souls, though you've got to remember what the games represent. In a time where gaming increasingly catered to a mass market and marked everything on your map for you. The Souls game said, here's a guy, go. They had the balls to be subversive in a time of conformity. And even when they stumble and look actually incomplete, I have to sit back and laugh. Turns out you can put whatever in your art. If it were pure and filtered, I wouldn't think anything of it. Wouldn't crack a smile, you know? Line mouth. But this stuff? It's nice to breathe. The game has quality locations, though. I mentioned the Undead Burg for its winding paths and low-key, high difficulty, but Sen's Fortress is just as enjoyable for making the player pay attention. Take the environment and the enemies into account instead of blazing through carelessly. Starting in the darkness and ending with a gorgeous view and raw sunlight makes it one of the few high-emotion environments of the game as well. There really is something magical about the first game and using simple sunlight to reward the player, a skybox a picture. The forest areas are inoffensive despite trees obfuscating combat somewhat. They're a welcome distraction from the death and decay of the many other biomes, and the Grand Archives makes use of vast vertical space and structure to create a challenge unlike anything else in the game. For every place I dislike, there's a genuinely enjoyable one. The best, though, sitting at a 50% view rate for the general player base, Yikes, is an Orlando. The Souls games all care about views, maybe because they like making the player feel small or part of something greater. Maybe Miyazaki just loves picturesque visuals. I don't know, but an Orlando is the original Dark Souls holy Wowza. sh view. Incidentally, it uncaps the uncanny vibe the games are so fond of. I mean, really, you just blasted through undead shithole, fantasy forests, the sewers, the double sewers, hell, some other places, and then you reach a real city, basked in an eternally setting sun. The guards are giants, totally still unless you step too close it's mostly empty. It's impossible to not respect the art direction, conveying that something is wrong with negative space, the lack of motion, the unanswered mystery. Arguably more than Demon Souls, the levels of Dark Souls tell stories directly related to their end bosses. Without ever reading a text document, we see piles of tortured souls in a jail connected to the Grand Archives, the site of Seath the Scaleless's life work. 
research on immortality. We descend down into Blighttown, a city buried underneath another, and descend further into the Demon Ruins, another civilization shoved deep into the earth with the Witch of Izalith and her children. The great weight of history imbuing the area makes it truly alien in a world you previously felt you understood. The sheer depth of the catacombs leading into the Tomb of the Giants, the absolute downward momentum leading to Gravelord Nito's final chamber, really drives home the point that the world is ancient, war-torn, and violent, that life demands death. What stands now stands atop an eon of loss. For all those words and feelings, nothing really topped Anne Orlando and Princess Guinevere. After a long journey and a tough boss against two opponents, you open a door to reveal this sun-dappled giant woman. It's ethereal, hard to describe, facing something that feels truly warm and meaningful, even godly. Which only makes it more brutal that everything, and Orlando's splendor, is a farce. Like I mentioned, Dark Souls is often called depressing, and not for no reason. The world is decaying, literally clinging to fading embers for any semblance of normalcy. The old powers clutch to what they have, even if it means becoming twisted, vile shells of their former selves, blind and mad, even propping up a false image of former power, posturing still at the end of the world. This game is from 2011. How does it feel like it's parodying the end of our actual Earth? That's not an exaggeration either. The world is scummy and parodies ours accurately. The painted world of Ariamis is an optional level tucked away in an Anne Orlando painting. It's full of grotesque, awful enemies and even the fouling slimes from Demon Souls. Because... God, you. And the final boss of the area doesn't even want to fight. She's a half-breed dragon person who escaped into this bleak nightmare world because it was the only place she could find solace in a cruel, judgmental reality. Do you see why people like these games with a little digging? Miyazaki, come on. Oh. Now I beat these games consecutively, so I like to think I'm able to compare them pretty well. People asked me, how'd you beat them so fast? Listen up. I grab my long sword and roll up like the fucking Terminator. I'm a vendor of damage, son. I'm slinging strings with my steel swings. I'm lyrically superior and I looked up boss strats when I needed help. I found the bosses of Dark Souls 1 way more annoying overall compared to Demon Souls, whose bosses ranged from pushovers to puzzles to punch outs. Very few bosses are free. The Moth is stupid, actually just flies down and exposes itself to you, but if you dodge wrong, it'll kill you. Pinwheel isn't difficult, and even the gaping dragon is just a movement mastery check, if we're being honest, and you can kinda just hang behind Seath and beat him to death, but many more bosses are outright flame lurker level all over again. Sif, for example, having a series of moves that must be respected, or you're getting fixed. Ornstein and Smo, possibly the greatest player filter in the game, requires you to play smart around pillars and focus down one, while the other beats on you, and then finish off the powered up other that you didn't kill. Quaylag can piss off, man. What the hell was that all about? Every player's run will be different, and I'm sure a stock pyromancer build eats half the bosses alive, but I still think it's good that the bosses are designed like this. It means some go down without popping a player blood vessel, and others feel super rewarding. Not every guy needs to be memorable, you know? Shoot, a ton of the bosses are straight up not required to complete the game. That's wild. I love that. It's perfect for an open, freely explored game about immersing into the world. There might be something crazy around the corner, and some players might never know. Unfortunately, Seath was a pushover, and he's one of the big deal people left alive in the world. How about the others? The Witch of Izalith is perhaps the worst boss in the series? Just for being so frustrating to kill? You aren't dying to normal damage, okay? It's... Oh, what? And then sometimes it's... Oh my god! It's a fight so bad that the devs made any damage permanent. You don't need to start Start the fight from scratch when you re-enter. I mean, at least they admit it. Nito, any boss that's a boss with at least 10 minions probably isn't getting a pass from me. In fact, Nito made me give up on my basic soldier LARP to don the ridiculously powerful Havel's armor so I could tank through all his hits and slap him to death. Havel's. Feels awful, but it works. So they left it to the final boss for the heavy lifting. Story time. The story you're not given, but left to piece together with context clues and text boxes on items, and even that's not enough for some characters, is about the world ending. The first flame, a primordial fire that literally created life and death by existing, spawned a series of powerful souls that were taken hold of by those story characters we just put down. They subjugated the dragons, and the Age of Fire began, but as time passed, the fire faded, and the 
lords grew weak and wary, all things die. Gwyn, the Lord of Sunlight, sacrificed himself to stoke the flames again, and the Second Age of Fire is where our character enters the plot. Mankind is dead and gone, because most of mankind is cursed with undeath, perpetually dying and being resurrected until they've degenerated into total insanity. It's why death zombifies you, why consuming humanity cures you, why humanity can be used to stoke bonfires and provide more Estus. Humanity is precious, a remnant of hope, a reminder of a greater age, when humans were worthwhile. But again, all things end, and humanity is in limited supply. Literally too, the consumable is actually limited in-game. Regardless of plot events, the lore of Dark Souls is deeply melancholic and moving. The characters you meet, no matter how bright and armored, tend to find only despair and loneliness. Even the final boss, Gwyn, the fated Lord of Sunlight, supposedly sacrificed but still clinging to existence, isn't given some bombastic theme, but the strongest piece in the OST. As you battle to death with the last vestige of a bygone era, deep in the kiln of the first flame. Seriously, what is this track? Who? Motoi Sakuraba, composer for Golden Sun, we meet again! Fing plin plin plot ass. I should have known it was you! And you're denied a meaningful ending, whether you listen to Frampt or Kath, the disgusting wriggling hell serpents who are pushing for a new age, either a new age of fire or age of darkness. They're both bad outcomes. Yes, the age of fire, again, is technically okay, but it's like living for 90 years and resetting to zero, so forcing the world through another cycle of unrest. It's just another shot in a universe that won't do any better this time. And an age of darkness means the fire fades, humans will live without humanity, free of the gods, but not aspiring to anything meaningful. Yeesh. Dark Souls 1 is a brain-blasting nightmare health Whoa! experience, ranging from peaceful to deeply utterly unhinged. The design feels experimental in a way even the prototype didn't, but it's truly memorable because of that, and among Souls games, it may well command the most raw pathos. The number of times I actually felt something was never matched again, at least in the mainline games. I'm serious, usually when I play games, I feel dead, so... Well, anyway, the lone DLC caps the game off well. In a world so thoroughly preoccupied with past empires and ancient lords, it only makes sense to travel back yourself. Artorius, the legendary knight who you learned about mid-game, is losing control of his humanity to the abyss. The actual environment isn't much to talk about, it's further from the fall. Still lush, foreshadowing the events of the main game. The real draw of the DLC is the Artorius boss fight. Madness as well, but we'll get there. Artorius is the prototype for the future of Souls games. This is the original Slave Knight Gale. This is where boss design was headed. It's a fight that completely contradicts the design of the game writ large, where most bosses made use of their environments in some way, either by demanding spatial control or spatial awareness, Artorius uses a flat, clear coliseum. Where most bosses are doable even with poor understanding of their movesets, Artorius demands the player understand his to within 60-70% accuracy. He's fast, highly lethal, and constantly moving around. The battle doesn't take place in the coliseum as much as within the range of your dodge roll. There isn't much room for error. The Artorius fight only happens because of Manus, however. Once again, the the player travels through a dead empire and down, down the black abyss to face its creator, the primordial human that ends up mostly important to the sequel, weirdly enough. Manus gives a little more room for error, but tacks on significant ranged options and extreme damage. He's just about as frustrating as Artorius for different reasons. He's also important to Soul's boss design, where Artorius is razor sharp, but still largely telegraphed and fair. Manus deals obscene damage for even a single mistake, but offers a lot more wiggle room between the various rocks to hide behind, and openings he leaves for the player. He feels a lot like your average large-scale Elden Ring boss, that is, tall enough that he obfuscates his own attacks, and magical enough that it's frustrating to learn the fight for a raw melee character. Shattering Manus' soul closes Dark Souls for good, and those shards would seed the lore for Dark Souls 2. The sequel's controversial for a lot of reasons, mostly owing to a director swap, an ad campaign, and a change of vision, but change is necessary for growth and perspective, regardless of the outcome Come, it's a fascinating point of comparison for the other games. Long ago, I was afraid of difficult things. When it rained, I would run inside. When the sun shone too bright, I sought the shade. But in those days, I was only a child, and there was so much work to do. Oh, I can't wait to read the comments on this one. F***ing would you just? Why anyway? What's the big deal? Haven't you heard? This is the worst Dark Souls game 
and secretly genius. I don't have time for this crap. Just play the thing and be honest. That's the rule. <laughs> That's hardly manipulative enough to be a story fit for YouTube. Okay, Dark Souls 2. Call this the guillotine because it's good at dividing people. Seriously, it's like a faction of giga brains that love it most. Flawless analogy. Now here at the K-Bash Show, we don't engage in fan partisanship or any of that stuff except all those times I did. So for the straight dope, you came to the right place. I had a big ol' arc with this one more than the other games actually. Game started hot, burned for a while, fell off, Exploded. I can definitively tell you that Dark Souls the Squeakquel is a video game you can play for fun sometimes. But it's best to go in expecting nothing. Most of the criticism is overblown, and a lot of the praise feels like sly contrarianism. And I can respect that. I've been both those people. Alas, the ever-evolving nature of the Discourse TM. Dark Souls 2 reminds me of the DM, who just finished their first completely homebrewed open-world campaign. It was messy, but even though the DM's friends had fun, the DM only remembers the stuff that went wrong. How that dungeon was too long and mostly unnecessary. How the party just went in a totally unexpected direction towards unprepared content. How the goals were defined, but direction was lacking. So for Campaign 2, they bust out the pre-written module. Sure Surely this time will be better, right? Seriously, that's how map design went moving forward. You can stick it on a chart. The game released in 2011, directed not by Miyazaki, but Tomohiro Shibuya and Yui Tanimura. The shift in design sensibilities is largely attributed to the new directors, but it's worth noting that Dark Souls had the cultural pull and the wiggle room to expand and experiment. It's probably only good that DS2 ended up like it did, even if the product is strange, in its own ways. Now I'm on Scholar of the First Sin Edition, the remaster for PS4, mostly because y'all ain't catch me running another Blight Town, and I think it skewed my view a bit. Clean 60 FPS, enhanced visuals, trouser tier inducing skyboxes, the game looks good for at least three or four levels. It opens with the few crumbs every Souls game gives you. You're a cursed undead, doomed to lose your sanity in time. There's a place you need to go and something you need to do, but some interesting language is used here. The narrator directly invokes fate, that you're fated to do the thing and burn up, more or less, describing the last game. I guess the reality of the universe is ever-ending empires buried under each new layer of ash repeating ad nauseum. That's fun. Makes sense, though, between either of one's endings, birthing another Age of Flame or entering into an Age of Darkness, it's hard to see anything definitive or meaningful in the previous conclusion. Now we're stuck in that uncertainty, unless we can break the chain of fate. All right, let's go! I love breaking fate in games. I was fated to be an unmotivated background character, but here I am, talking to the mic for free. Ah! Okay, I'll stop. And part of breaking fate with this game, for me, was being told how alleged awful it was up front. I assumed it was the worst thing ever, and to be fair, I don't know how to rank it, but let's take a look. I took pains to claim my playthrough early, as it were. I browsed builds and spoiled all the armor sets and went with a basic hexer. That means dark magic because it's badass, a mix of intelligence and faith, and a whole lot of everything else. Build eats souls for breakfast. Stat points, I mean, it's fairly unwieldy. But I wanted to play my little dark magic caster, so damn it, I went out and got it. And it owned. Hold up. Perfect. Once assembled, it tore through the early game, sent countless bosses to the Shadow Realm on first pass. I loved Dark Souls 2, and why wouldn't I? I could keep enemies at bay with a little kiting and pummel them with dark orbs. I could lure a group and crowd control with scraps of life and dark storm. I could swap to my trashy hand axe when I ran low on spells, buff my weapon with dark magic, and debuff the enemy's defense. And since I was building faith, I could use healing magic if I really needed it. The build was amazing. Hard carried the play playthrough until the DLC, and sometimes mage builds suffer in these games with hard to replenish spell uses. I can't imagine running a pure caster in the last game with so few bonfires. I mean, I'm sure it's possible, but it's not like they make it easy. That's actually one of the major changes across entries, too. Litter the map with checkpoints, and you can fast travel to all of them. This is one of the common points of contention. Propped up in a vacuum is bad design, but the purpose of minimal bonfires in the first game was strong-arming the player, aka 
rewarding the player for charting the world and digging for treasure. It was a map that was linked straight through, so the player needed to understand the terrain. DS2 has no such world, so it needs no such checkpoint design. It's a linear game. It's almost never a question of where to go, but rather, what do I need? What key opens the next place, and where is that? Because most of the levels lead directly into one another, with a few deviating paths. Like a tree branch! I think that burned a lot of people on release, like, really? This is what you're following that game up with? But time's been kind to Dark Souls 2. You don't need to make the same game twice. That one's still there. Still good. Still like... 40 hours, Jesus. Try something new, and if you hate it, the studio will come around eventually. One thing that stood out here is NPCs and the general sense of community. You find all kinds of strange people throughout the game, either hanging around or trapped in stone, and most of them end up back in Majula. It somehow feels more whimsical than one. You know, the talking cat. The weird blacksmith. Okay, okay, they've all been weird. Maybe it's the eternally setting sun making NPCs feel warmer. Because <laughs> they tend to keep with the Souls tradition, like helping Lucatiel here and getting her help later on. Oh shit, they even got the crestfallen guy! Have you noticed how high this place is? How long do you think it'd take? Okay, I'm calling the cops! On that note, let's talk about the good before getting weird. Design shifted all over the place. Game's like a chameleon, and part of that was designer expectations for the player. Healing yourself in this game is different than both of the previous games. Couldn't settle for greatness. Literally ever, it looks like. The Estus Flask is back but heals you gradually after a short rev up, so no shooting to full in a second. You gotta plan that sh Second, you can stock up on life gems, another heal over time consumable. So grass, but worse. I like having more options though. The game's hard enough at times. Still, swapping band-aids for prescriptions, I... That makes it sound terrible. I've been scrubbing the footage here, trying to figure out exactly what Dark Souls asks of the player in combat. And everything I've said before, you know, patience, reactivity, seizing crucial moments, guerrilla-style play, that's all highly rewarded, but you're often only fighting single strong enemies, multiple weak enemies on occasion, or made to break groups up using the level design. Dark Souls 2 features a lot more enemies than you'd fight on average in one, and certainly in Demon Souls. So you're still playing guerrilla style, regardless of your build, but you're more often punished for zeroing in on a single enemy. I actually like that a lot. The lock-on feature is nice, but it's a crutch. It actively makes several boss fights throughout the series, harder. It's almost like 2 is reacting to that weakness of the earlier Souls games. Like, yeah, cameras are hard and lock-on makes it worse sometimes, so trust the space, trust your instincts. You've got object permanence, so f*** <laughs> use it. It's hitting the same notes, but curing a bad habit. I learned about switching lock-on off in Bloodborne years ago, and thank god I did, because whew, you don't want to lock-on much in 2. It's not just basic enemies. Many bosses aren't big dudes at all, contrary to the it's all armor dudes meme. No, you fight multiple swarms of little guys constantly. The skeleton lords demand the player run, hide behind pillars, take each lord out one at a time. The belfry gargoyles basically parody the old bell tower gargoyles, but give you five total opponents. Good god. I love the ruined sentinels for making use of divide and conquer tactics, having the player take out one above, then escaping below as another jumps up to quickly dispatch the other. The royal rat vanguard is literally just rats, and lots of them, but only one has the boss health bar. Still locking on? Have fun, hombre. How about the twin dragon riders that basically demand you keep unlocked, or at least locked onto the ground guy and reacting to the archer via audio cues? He's not even visible for most of the fight. That's a crazy amount of trust to put in the player. And yes, even more fights follow this pattern, so it's obvious. The devs are testing the player to play in a new way. It's not that Dark Souls 2 is poop -a garbage it's just challenging old players differently. Well, so there is this one little thing. It's just... The dodging doesn't work right? Look, I'm sorry. DS2 apologists, your game is fun most of the time, but the game has a bad rap for a reason, more than just uncharitable discourse. The hitboxes are straight schwacked. Just gonna say it, let's take a look. Oh, taking notes from Lords of Shadow, huh? And worse than those, and there are many of those. The efficacy of the dodge roll is suspect because it's directly affected by two factors. Rather than just weight impacting your roll, you also need to invest in the adaptability stat, which buffs a substat called agility that any Dark Souls player from the old days probably isn't getting invested in because they're looking for a damage stat, health, endurance, and damage stat too. Agility isn't super enticing at a glance, but it turns out 
it directly increases the iframes, the invincibility, the core value of the souls roll. That's actually just insane. Maybe it's a secret good thing that only highly agility invested players can use the most basic damage mitigation mechanic. I think it's an attempt to give cloak and dagger players a stronger niche than just being armed worse on average. And I'm really glad that there's stat point respects this time, but uh literally almost vomited. And the mechanics are a little wonky. I didn't feel it right away, but something is genuinely sluggish and weird about the combat. I noticed after totally respecting into a melee build for the DLC, maybe it's the 60 FPS or the slightly smooth movement, but still stiff Dark Souls attacks with their endless recovery frames. Maybe it's that enemies don't seem to react as viscerally to attacks. Whatever it is, alongside rolling, thing feels weird. Now you can still play it just about the same, throwing a shield up and strafing for backstabs. Shoot, I did it with my greasy hex hermit for half the game, so it's not this dramatic undoing of everything Souls was. It's fine. And to the dev's credit, the level design, though linear, still hits the same notes. You're still doing light platforming to find treasure, and being made to contextualize combat through the lens of whatever hazards are present, from pillars to corridors, light itself is used far more consistently consistently than previous titles with this little torch system, basically permanently lighting sconces if you take the time. In the old games, you got Tomb of the Giants and a few other spaces, but DS2 has the gutter, a level you're made to light up yourself entirely. Multiple rooms in regular levels lack light, but do not lack enemies. It's a dangerous game to run through, arguably more lethal than the first. It's actually wild seeing old reactions to the trailers and director interviews. Like Buddy said he wanted to make the game more accessible and proceeded to gate dodge rolling usefulness behind a mediocre combat stat. La Mal. Dark Souls 2 is playable and several bosses are easier than some of the nonsense in 1, but it's plenty hard on its own. Speaking of which, what a good level, you guys. Several levels are just nonsense. DS1 had all kinds of problem areas, all right? Blight Town, the entire tree segment right by Blight Town, the sewers leading to Blight Town. Starting to think this place is a tumor. DS2, on the other hand, has this entire watery strip, the Shrine of Amana, that's designed so, so tightly with projectile jackasses dealing piles of damage, swarms of guys digging into Uranus, unseeable death drops, really great vacation location. Check it out. The gutter is bad, but the Black Gulch is awful. I don't know why you'd recreate the misery of Blight Town and then force the player to march into actual hell. And then hide some really important stuff under the gulch with a jump I don't know how you make without a guide. You know, really shooting for excellence here. Most of the areas aren't bad, but the few that are really stand out. Linear design is interesting because you can account for the player's route and tailor it just so and have it challenge a range of builds and weapons. And don't worry, I couldn't forget the Black Fortress, even if I tried. This piece of yeah. shit is probably the flat worst in the game. Highly aggressive, highly armored enemy groups with plenty of range support and a web of perilous walkways make it genuinely miserable to navigate. Even when you think you got the hang of the place, it whips out some pins for your fingernails, just like for fun, I guess. And enemies stop respawning if you kill them 12 times. Okay, cool. But seriously, making it harder to run through the levels with highly cropped and manicured difficulty is basically contrary to the Souls series design ethos. An enemy despawns is in fact a design concession. Anyone who tells you DS2 is too casual might be legally insane. It rewards strength builds fairly well, hexers most of the time, blunt weapons in general. Each Souls game has a few blind spots and nigh on the useful tools, but this game is ready and waiting to kick your ass. It's not even nice about it, like the walk into Blight Town and the luring enemy trick. And this is the easy version. I have to stress that I'm playing the easier, gutted version of the game. I don't even want to know what the hell's going on in vanilla. One thing I've ignored since DS1 is the Covenant system. A player will likely gain access to Covenants first via Guinevere and Anne Orlando. It was mostly a multiplayer thing, but the point is you'd farm up some collectibles via assisting players or killing them or whatever else the Covenant asked and turn them in for light rewards. It was a fairly opaque system on first pass and DS2 actually puts them in your face sooner, more frequently. It feels plausible to interact with many. You don't need to scour and hunt to engage engage with a gameplay feature. And it's a cool idea. Ropes players into the world a bit, makes them feel like they belong somewhere. But every system in Dark Souls that 
isn't combat or directly related to increasing player damage, so smithing is mostly ignorable otherwise, and some are even looked down on at times. Some very serious people take offense to others beating the game via multiplayer, which is fascinating because it's a multiplayer game and hey, in 3 at least, the devs are real deliberate about removing multiplayer options for certain climactic fights. Right, not every fight matters that much, so why is the AI partner system, a system present since Demon Souls and dedicated to assisting a troubled player that also touches on themes of connectivity and trust, hope at the end of the world? How is that system despised by the broader base? If you're stuck, and generally if you've completed at least part of a character's side quest as well, you can summon an NPC before several boss battles. Crucially, not every boss has a summon, but most do. I'll admit, after playing through two games, I was getting tired and I summoned the rare time to make a problem go away and to generally comment on the system. It made this fight in particular a breeze and that's really the danger and the strength. Nobody loses anything using a summon to win except the player, and the player gets to decide if they lost. And hey, not all builds are equally compatible with all bosses. I think it's a smart failsafe system to keep a playthrough lubricated. Alternatively, they can do this. What? Fall into your death before ever hitting the boss room. I'd scream if I weren't dying inside. The people who get mad about summons ultimately are the same people who'd be furious if a young person's student loans were forgiven. The people who do every single thing by the book and expect everyone else to do the same. The people who wouldn't take a day off work for a funeral or wedding. The people who can't imagine other people and their differing needs and interests. In short, people you don't need to worry about. Their bloodlines are weak and they will not leave their mark on history. Otherwise, there isn't much going on with the base games bosses. I like the multi-battles for novelty's sake, but most of the others feel like retreads. Some of them literally are retreads, like that's Ornstein on screen. And very few ask the player to do new things, mechanically speaking. It's still about blocking, rolling, and running, watching, waiting, and reacting. Like why comment on all of them if they all go down just about the same? Fire off enough dark blasts and these dudes blend into a slurry. It's nuts. I'm kind of taken aback by how this all fits together in the tapestry of Souls design. Experimentation. Diverging from the path is healthy, but we're left with a game that casts off a lot of Demon Souls' ease of play, aside from the addition of fast travel, abandons the complex and intriguing map design of one for a linear experience that's surprisingly brutal. And really, I'm not sure who's supposed to be jazzed by that. Someone who really likes inching through trap-ridden dungeons tile by tile, I guess? Y'all played back during Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, huh? Bought yourself a 10-foot pole? Seriously, one of the strengths, one of the great accessibility options of Souls games, historically, is allowing the player choice in ignoring the environment and enemy placements and running straight to the boss. I'm playing through Elden Ring right now. All the way to the latest game, FromSoft encourages that kind of behavior. And why wouldn't they? The levels are often more frustrating than the bosses, at least the pre-Sekiro games. You don't even need to backtrack in Elden Ring, you can just warp between checkpoints once they're unlocked. Same for Dark Souls. Souls 3, so why in 2 are several levels designed to resist the run? Ultimately, it's probably because the designers thought this is a linear experience. It should be cropped so the player has to work for the win, but it won't be impossible. They're not backtracking anymore, so there's no need to make level traversal trivial. We can fine-tune it to force engagement. Do you see the issue in that, though? For a game supposedly being made with accessibility in mind, many of its levels actively resist the ultimate in player accessibility. The boss run, the gorilla play conceit. I kinda hate that. Dark Souls 2 is not a bad game, but it's a very specific experience that will clash with player expectations coming off earlier titles. There's no avoiding it. Oh, and the DLC is f possible. This is the first game, the only game in the entire set that made me put the thing down and come back weeks later. Sekiro was a personal cross that I got up and dealt with. The three DLCs are so hard it's obscene, highlighting everything bad about linear Souls design with its ridiculous stat requirements, highly tuned encounters, multiplayer focus for at least one segment of each, rendering them hopelessly difficult for solo players, and ball-busting boss design. If I put the game down, having never touched these. I would have gone ahead saying that 2 was actually really enjoyable, but between respects to figure out what was wrong with my build, trying to play honestly, trying to play dishonestly, I lost so much faith in the game's systems. And that's not a condemnation of the rest, right? The non-DLC DS2 journey is fine and playable, but this stuff can chew gravel. Okay, I'm sorry, what? Things are going well. 
as you can see. I'm characterizing the DLCs to make a point, but let's review some facts. I held off on them till after every other game was recorded. That's how hard I bounced. But after respecting into adaptability, the dodge roll stat, dexterity, etc., I ended up dual wielding basic long swords because they are my sole weapon and infused them with lightning. I proceeded to brute force my way through every DLC level, every obnoxious boss, and felt genuine happiness after completing it. Like, I don't feel that stuff very much anymore. Hardly did with Sekiro. Hardly did with Elden Ring. But this particular achievement, whether because the Burnt Ivory King was extremely difficult, the Fume Knight's damage was totally absurd, and Surlon could clip me with a hitbox bigger in Texas with his stabbing move, I don't know, it felt good. Like, finally, I can take a break. Shelva has all these Indiana Jones-ass segments, tricks and traps, stone pressure plate stuff. It's surprisingly fun. Like, the level of playfulness in the design is super endearing. Ilium Lois is a sharp, extremely punishing area, but it's the first to reward the player for fully exploring the environment. That's not insignificant, even if it runs counter to the design of other Souls games. It also houses the single worst multiplayer area yet designed. A oh, room tower makes use of vertical level design that gives it a nice oaky texture. It's just fun design, what do you want from me? Yes, the levels are frustrating, and yes, I've been finding gray hairs. Such is life, okay. All told, I don't agree with the damage on the Fume Knight because he's super simple to fight, just dodge every attack. If you take two hits without healing, you're dead, and he's programmed to run at you if he catches a healing, so the trick is baiting him into an animation, usually by rolling behind him to heal up. 7.5 out of 10, purely adequate fight. So the Souls games, and arguably most in DS2, push intense challenges onto the player, and sometimes it pays off. I bet the century specifically gives the highest high, and specifically because the level of challenge, how crafted the challenge can be, is ambrosially evil. So thumbs up for being evil. In case you weren't sold on my bit about the linearity of DS2 also creating a lot of feels bads through forced engagement scenarios, the DLCs all double down on the idea, making the player stop and do chores until some battle is finished, some action completed, some item scrounged and placed in a slot. Demon Souls had subversive design when it hit store shelves. Very rarely did you require a key to get somewhere. Even if some doors were locked, many were circleable or circumventable, and few locked doors were necessary for progression. Instead, hiding powerful secret items. Dark Souls 2 makes a point of reining the player in, demanding certain behaviors. It doesn't reward cunning, but rather adherence. And that's wild considering the narrative. I love jerking off about loot and narrative harmonies these days when the gameplay and the narrative are telling the same story, helping each other out. I believe this is referred to as frauding, but the entire point of the second game here is to break fate. Wild then that you're constrained by the level design, forced to jump through hoops, and generally thwarted by specific enemies and bosses if you're on a specifically under-supported build. The game that should care, maybe the most about player sovereignty, hardly does. And you can drop a counterpoint here, it's all subjective. Maybe the point is really to hammer home how difficult Breaking Fate is, how the game itself confines the player to shackles they must genuinely struggle to break. And there's beauty in that idea too, just not as much fun to play through. Whereas a game designed to allow the player all the things Souls games traditionally do would preserve the fun while producing narratively mimetic gameplay, or gameplay that mirrors the idea of Breaking Fate. Well anyway, here's the ending. Provided you don't do a few extra things like talking to a bonfire ambush person several times and killing an old man, eventually you hunt down one of the sisters born of the Shards of Manus, who's the real villain of the story having tricked a kingdom into its own downfall. She dies and you get in the tomb, taking your place in the great cycle. Or you can leave and allow the flame to burn out and become the Dark Lord. None of these endings break fate. You either perpetuate the cycle or allow the Age of Darkness to begin. Just like the last game, you either allow humanity to linger on and cling desperately to hope with an inevitable end, or let it go peacefully. Boo. Or, having done all that funny stuff, you now have the blessing of the old king, granting a crown that allows the player to retain their humanity and live agelessly. No longer a part of this cycle. So, in choosing not to sacrifice yourself, you become an ageless entity, greater than the world, an S-tier individual, someone who genuinely earned what they got. That's a more fitting end to two than I can imagine, handing the player an actual kingly reward for sticking it out and pulling through, casting off the yoke of fate. Still bleak for the rest of 
of the world, but uh, two is easily the weakest of the group in my mind. I figure a player who really likes a stiff challenge or a particular build from this game will like it best. Maybe a story or lore buff might dig into the world and characters and gameplay enough to put it above demons. Who knows? And really, if you were off-put by the aesthetics of one, particularly the bosses everyone loves, I can see liking two as the hipster pick. Look guys, all I'm saying is Nights in the Nightmare is super fun and cool. It just takes an hour of tutorials and 30 hours of guided practice. Where'd everyone go? Is it possible that the sun I ran away from only shone so bright to bring me warmth, and that in my endless running, spurned the light and courted shadow? Okay, you need to know some things about Dark Souls 3. If you use a bleed build, you're bad. If you use self sword twin blades, you're bad. If you don't parry, you're bad. If you go pyromancy, you're bad. If you poison. Why would shooting a spirit work? Because it always works in these things. It always works! F this one's kind of a homecoming for me. Bloodborne may have been my first Souls experience, but Dark Souls 3 was my first Dark Souls. I remember hearing how different it'd be, how being slow and reactive mattered, how I should really get a shield and throw it up. So naturally, I went Dex Int because the Ice Scythe weapon looked cool, and even though it was an endgame weapon, I could probably get there quick enough. It was probably the hardest game I'd ever played at that point, right up there with vanilla PS2 Devil May Cry 3, and I never finished it properly. Dark Souls is thought of as difficult, and it is, but it universally demands a set of skills that Bloodborne didn't really teach. I'm happy to say that playing Demons through 2 paid off with interest. This entry takes place in the same world, a very tired world in need of a proper finale. Let's be real, neither 1 nor 2 get definitive ends or even meaningful world progression. The world is either reset or ended. The Eternal Edge. The Cosmic Cock Cage. Dark Souls 3 expands the lore enough to account for a new protagonist, one who's mostly incapable of putting things to rest. The Ashen One, an ancient undead warrior like the protags of past games, has a particular role to play. They once failed to become a Lord of Cinder, rendering them unkindled. That means, in shorthand, that they weren't as useful to the First Flame as the Lords of Cinder, so bench warm ad nauseum until the fire is threatened and they're drawn to link the flame. Wait a minute. This is just like any other game, isn't it? You're just a Mamma mia. guy with bad chances, and you're gonna be presented with blinking the flame again, or letting the fire die again. How? I'll get into the story later, but I'm impressed with how repetitious it is. You gotta respect someone who commits to the bit. It's not that the Souls games and their stories are bad. On the contrary, many characters and bosses have compelling backstories and really interesting lore to dig up, giving the player a chance to examine lives lived in basically hell. It's just that the actual events, taken in macro view, aren't super compelling. In fact, the game pulls aesthetic sleight of hand to cast an old experience in a new coat of paint. Your guy doesn't appear human or zombie-like, they're laced with fading flames. You trudge through cityscapes and poison swamps in unholy beautiful locales, but not much is actually different. The visuals are often more colorful and the lighting stark, but the levels still feel like other Souls games. Though I really enjoy Dark Souls 3 and would play it again, if only for its modern opulence and mechanics, it's not an exceptionally unique experience. Sandwiched between Bloodborne and Sekiro, and ultimately swallowed by Elden Ring, it feels intentional. A final nod before tossing the match, Fan reception was fairly mixed, setting aside the early hype and YouTube content factory. People wrote things like, Miyazaki's run out of ideas, and worst Souls game, for various reasons, which is weird to me because this game seems like a publisher concession. Like yeah, Souls can make a lot of money, one did amazing, and two got some pushback, so go make us a trillion and you can make all the stupid spin-offs you want. I'm imagining the scenario here, but it doesn't seem far off given everything. And I don't want to start this review negative, so let's talk about something positive. Depending on your rig, DS3 can hit a clean 60 FPS, and the game is stunning. The first all-round incredible visual set from this series. Souls was always good at framing beauty, like several shots could be taken from a romantic era textbook on the picturesque, but three in particular makes use of sharp light, heavy shadow, stoic architecture, strewn details, generally high fidelity in symphony. Things often look bleak on the ground, but 
hope shines from the sky. It's an unreal visual feast I would recommend purely for aesthetic. I don't do that often, maybe with like Legend of Mana and a few others. And at least for longtime fans, the game should feel super familiar. Compared to the stiff fluidity of two, an oxymoron for sure, but true in practice, three feels just like one. It's such an incredible feeling picking up a longsword again and thinking, yeah, I could probably kill God with this sh That's the value, for me, a new aesthetic experience mixed with the gameplay I love. It's not a total return to form, however, DS1 is a weird game, and it holds the title for most bizarre puzzle box world yet conceived among Souls games. 3 borrows heavily from 2, so the game's route is mostly linear with a few branching paths that turn into dead ends. To compensate, not every level is contiguous with only the prior and preceding zones, and the levels themselves have twists and turns, multiple paths the player can choose to go down, with secret ways and shortcuts seeded throughout. Like yes, the Poison Swamp sucks, we all hate Poison Swamps, and if you don't, you're a Miyazaki plant off with your fingernails, but the swamp in general can be approached in multiple ways, left, right, or center, there's something generally in every direction. And that's the fun, really. You can climb a ladder onto this gorgeous bridge with an immaculate view of the surrounding landscape, and fight a demon straight from the first game. You can wander through the level until you're ganked by three strange, gibbering freaks. Who cares? And that's off the beaten path, there's still the level's boss to contend with. The other swamp has a pool with a giant crab you could fight on through, or travel to the right or left and end up fighting a boss far away from what you probably assume is the expected route. I don't think the levels of Dark Souls 3 get enough credit for how layered and how complex they can individually be. Where 2 generally felt like a straight path through some hot nonsense, 1 was also that most of the time, only it was young and felt slightly looser, like you were expected to go a certain way but you could handle it a few ways. 3 constantly throws opulent, multi-level environments at the player with a single ultimate goal, but plenty of ways to get lost. Think of the monastery grounds in general, how sprawling and tiered that level is, or the early game village in its own whens and ways the player can take to reach the boss, or the side content attached to the level. I think it's unfair to frame the game as bad or lazy when it's mostly hitting the same notes as other games. The game also borrows the bonfire system from 2, so frequent checkpoints that can be freely fast-traveled between. I've heard these suck on occasion, but aside from making the game more enjoyable for me and encouraging the player to explore nooks and crannies, regardless of how many warp points exist, all bonfires really do is serve to give the player more breaks and buff magic builds by making MP more easily refilled. I don't think that's a crime, and it's not super difficult to notch the encounter intensity by adding more enemies, more obnoxious enemies, etc. Still, 3 feels like this weird baby produced by the shrieking miserable coitus between 1 and 2, and the baby inherited a lot of the traits from the parent everyone thinks is a bore. Regardless, those traits pay off specifically toward what the game ends up pushing. When you think of Dark Souls 3 and its unique additions, what comes to mind first? The only thing I can think of that affects regular play is the skill system. Every weapon has a skill or weapon art ranging from low-key stanced up slash attacks, spins, sometimes really acrobatic flourishy stuff, and several legends legendary and magical weapons get flashy and beautifully animated skills unique to them. And these skills end up being the worth of Dark Souls 3, why I like the game so much, why I don't get people who don't. To me, Souls games have always been about the build. It's the thing you can immediately share and compare with other players. It's the first talking point. How'd you beat X, Y, or Z? And Souls games are pretty stingy with upgrade materials too. It's very likely you'll only ever upgrade two, maybe three, to peak efficiency over the course of a full playthrough, so players get pretty attached to their weapons and their builds. It's really worth considering in a series that hands the player an absolute hurricane of bladed kill sticks and forces them to choose. I think one of the two major design focuses with 3 is combat. Not just mechanics, but encounters. Consider the levels and the enemies found within. Now that 2 and its sensibilities are on the table, and linearity is part of the fundamental design, you're made to fight some really tight and well-considered battles throughout the levels. Any Souls player who's pulled through the series up until now probably won't find them overly painful, but I distinctly remember making a point of running through to hit as many checkpoints as I could the first time I played. I have to highlight 
invite the village again for throwing some basic enemies in the player's face first, then opening up into a freeform battle with a pack of unsuspecting, easily backstabbed enemies and a single giant enemy that'll womp you if you don't face him solo. Or you can sneak around the encounter entirely, but you're rewarded with an Estus Shard, a flask upgrade for completing it. Later on, you're given a tight alley and a pack of charging enemies, alongside a guy on a bridge with a homing projectile, but critically, a house to duck into for safety, allowing you to dispatch the foot soldiers and rush the ladder down the way. Many of the levels are like this, posing unique gambits that consider the actual environment, and it makes for compelling moment-to-moment -moment play. I mean, aside from the lake, the f*** is that all about? It's hard to talk about the DLC levels. They're fine, and create some really memorable sights and scenes for the series. Basically redoing the painted world of Ariamis from the first is a pretty clear signal from the studio that they either really liked the original setting, enough that they wanted more of it, or they want to convey how dead oh. tired the world is. Kind of hard to say. And the other available zone, the Ringed City, is a dangerous, sprawling, multi-tiered area that's actually great for PvP. It's the only place I actually found a regular PvP at my level. I forced a guy off a cliff. I am not very good at Souls PvP. I don't want to touch on them because, aside from some really obnoxious little design pieces, uh, the arrow volley and other crap, there's nothing really notable about them from a gameplay perspective that's not represented in the other levels. The damage is so high in 3 that you end up just blazing through where you can. You're steeled by that point, you know? Not taking it in as much as putting it down. And I could keep going, but the point is many encounters in the game make intelligent use of space and placement, but ask the player to find a solution that has nothing to do with dex or int or faith or whatever stat, but rather basic mechanics and environmental thinking. This, alongside the frequent bonfires, means the game caters to many builds while attempting to challenge all players equally. And unlike 2's general damage type imbalances, by the way, 3 does pretty well at balancing resistances across the board. So the build. After playing Strength, Faith, Basic Quality, and Hexer, I wanted to have a little fun. So I kind of went Strength and then went Quality again down the line, but point is, I got the Farron Greatsword. And that weapon art? Those flips? Oh my god! I know it's cliche, but the Farron Greatsword is such a beautiful and elegant weapon. Its strange ducks and flips, all performed with the dedicated weapon art button, actually provide a janky built-in dodge so you can mash into a lot of enemies, but not every enemy. Spellcasters and other ranged attackers were dangerous, and swarms were manageable, but could rack up damage if I sat around in my attacking frames, otherwise vulnerable to hyper-aggressive types as my stamina drained out. Like, get hyped for three if you're a fighting game fan, one weapon art on a particular sword gives you super armor. Like, you can just armor through attacks. <laughs> There's so many fantastic weapon arts and interesting ways to play that Dark Souls 3, with its considered encounters and striking levels, it's got more replayability in my mind than most of the franchise. I want another run. I love this game and its animations. That's nothing to sneeze at. People get mad that FromSoft makes a point of reusing assets between games, but if it's saving dev time and, in the case of weapon arts, allowing the studio to create these unreal animations and make the game sing in the frame, it's only for the best. Catering to the build trademark is like the ultimate in supporting player sovereignty. And the encounters are tuned for it. I'm trying to empathize with the haters, bro. I want to know why you ain't like builds and want to f*** the map instead. Like, do you roll it up? What the devs care about, where their money goes, and what they push, is like the design thesis of the game, right? Maybe that's an oversimplification, Kojima cutscenes, etc., but three pushed weapon animations and boss animations. In the old days, many bosses were repeated, reappeared later on, had stiff or otherwise frugal animations, yeah? Shoot, two made basic enemies the boss more than once, and they put their gold into what counted, but they didn't go truly insane with the stuff until three. After a deep bedrock of repurposing, purposeable assets existed. In a way, Dark Souls' development and its actual universe, a series of kingdoms built on top of other kingdoms, run parallel. The games and their development are mimetic of their worlds. What the fuck? Anyhow, the bosses are immaculate. At some point, someone realized that since people could and would run directly to the boss rooms, and Shrine of Amana was at one point an area of a Dark Souls game, they ensured the bosses were tough, frequently powered up partway through, and overall represented a quality mix of 
of player challenges. When I look back at the list and think of who I would remove first, it's the gimmick fight, Yorm the Giant, because gimmicks aren't relevant to the player's build, and the ancient wyvern, which, amazing environment, and you technically could fight it, but it's a setup for a big epic plunge attack that kind of eviscerates the interest in killing a dragon. Nice visual though. The rest are amazing. Take the very first boss, a very Souls-esque knight type enemy with broader sweeping strikes and great reach, but more than that, he fights with these wild, fluid motions. And right away, the game hits the Dark Souls high when the pus of man, this abyss shadow, grows out of him. And now his range and damage are insane, and you've got to be really deliberate. Awesome fight, super striking and memorable. Fort is kind of crazy because he can do this obnoxious charge move. Almost everything else is immaterial, but he can and will mix you up with how many times he charges. And the damage is so high, one wrong move means death. I want to dislike that, but dodging matters. Some people want a fat roll, but you won't survive over encumbered for long, and Vort checks that real quick. The early game sets some real high expectations with the curse rotted Greatwood, a fairly average fight that drops the floor from underneath the player. Yeah, now we're playing with whole environments and like fundamental rules of play, because there's no fall damage here, though there normally would be. Then you're stuck helpless underground with this really tough boss fight. The Crystal Sage makes use of ranged attacks and clones. I was surprised how tough the fight was this time around, but how willing I was to get up and do it again. More than other games, I'd argue, 3 makes use of crazy damage values and it leads to some intense battles. The problem I see blooming here is one that becomes especially relevant in the DLC and more so in Elden Ring, but we'll talk when we get there. The Deacons of the Deep harkens back to Dark Souls 2, even Bloodborne, but they're not too much to talk about. Done that already? Many of the beast or giant type bosses are cool by virtue of standing out. Wolnir, the giant undead whose bangles need to be shattered to win the fight, is a great example of a battle that's more atmosphere than combat. The goal is simple, but it's made difficult by the skeletons in the arena, the boss's giant stature rendering him untouchable at times. He's highly telegraphed but slightly harder to dodge because of the darkness and his hands that extend out of sight. It's not perfect, but it encapsulates the fear of being dragged down into the darkness well. And the old Demon King seems familiar at first, but unleashes so many non sensical, dangerous fire attacks. Big dumb brutes in Souls games usually just crush or smash, but this guy makes you dance. It's scary. Most of the other bosses feel like highly lethal duels with other great warriors of your era, like the Abyss Watchers who can be parried, staggered, treated like other enemies, but SUPERCHARGED! Pontiff Sullivan is such an insane fight, I have no idea how he went down this time. Even though the fight is tough and memorable, it's worth noting that, at least according to PS4 stats, Dark Souls 3 doesn't have a lot of player base filter moments, just the one between the very first boss and Vort, with only one level separating them. After that, the game tends to lose 1 to 4% of the player base each boss, which seems reasonable for Dark Souls. Even the supposed hardest fight in the game, discounting TLC, has a 50% achievement unlock rate, so either the game's good, the fans know what to expect, or the encounters are balanced. It's a smooth experience, right? Souls done pop the Jurgens. The Dancer of the Boreal Valley is another incredible duel that demands fast and repeated reactions from players. It's a perfect display of the fluidity of animation that devs worked for. And let's throw Aldrich into this for their sweeping attacks and massive, hard to avoid magic carpet bombings. It's a pretty common thread in Souls discussion that the games need an easy mode, and it sucks listening to because, yeah, I also don't see a problem with cheating through an old RPG if you get to experience the story cutscenes and it's for your own fun good on you. Souls could have an easy mode, and arguably all the ways the player can power up and even cheese certain fights and make use of summons for most but not all are the intended way to make the games easy, but Miyazaki's made it pretty clear that he wants players to experience the joy of overcoming struggle. I contend he means that with a little asterisk, like as long as you find a way, it's valid, no matter the way. It's a nice idea, but falls apart pretty easily because plenty of people are already struggling between disabilities, ridiculous underpaid hours, all kinds of stuff. Like, great if you have the time and the ability to beat all these. And I'm just saying, think what you want about the art and how it's best enjoyed. But if you make a public talking point that others need to experience it as intended by the artist, please stop talking. There's too much self-serving, back-patting chicanery from online bros who want to thank their guts for beating a game. I get it, you have nothing but sneering contempt for anyone who can't do what you can. Brought a megaphone for the quiet part, huh? You know, hard games are kind of dime a dozen. Lots of stuff's hard, with all kinds of differing contexts for difficulty, but only so 
souls sold en masse. And I like to think it's a little deeper than Ooga Booga, me beat hard game. You fight a couple more armors because Dark Souls 2 is all armor guys. It's only armor guys, you guys, and now we're in hell. The game's remaining fights are immensely difficult, if only because you need to memorize their movesets somewhat wholesale to survive, and they're frustrating specifically because I felt forced into a specific playstyle to win. And when I did, it was trivially easy, meaning the illusion of choice kind of shattered in a second. The Twin Princes, the final boss, and all the DLCs and bosses fit into this category. I mean, take the Twin Princes, a boss that fires off huge waves of magic you can just barely dodge running full tilt, a boss that'll teleport off screen screwing up your lock-on and he's got enough range to hit you off camera. It's not particularly fun. And the second phase has the other prince healing the big guy on occasion, so you really have to lay into him while weaving your way through tons of magical crap. The Nameless King is, well, some people call him the hardest boss in the Soul series. I think that's been overturned since. But again, with the double phases, the massive move pools, the intense damage these guys do, and how strict the dodge windows are for some moves. <laughs> The ultimate boss battles include him, the Soulless Cinder, Sister Freed, and Slave Knight Gale. Oh boy. As I've said, you can't summon an NPC ally for these fights, with the exception of half the Freed fight. The game wants you to handle them on your own, playing directly into the oft-touted community opinion that you haven't truly beaten a Souls boss unless you did it solo, without summons. It's kind of frustrating because I never really got the hype. I've played hard games before, I've had my little victories, and it's an extremely tight rope to be walking for a video game, assuming its bosses are tuned just finely enough to not be bullshit. Yeah. But yeah, Nameless King is pretty much bullshit. If the damage were cut by 25%, he wouldn't be a problem. But here we are. The Soul of Cinder, the final boss, isn't unbearable because of damage as much as his exceptionally varied move pool. Dude literally transforms multiple times, swaps from caster to assassin to warrior. It's tough getting a grasp on every moveset and every punish window. I stopped dead at this fight the very first time I played for that reason. Sister Freed is among the most annoying fights in the game, featuring invisible ambushes and too late audio cues, so you're made to preempt when she's going invisible to punish before the attack ever goes off. And in phase two, you have a summoned ally. That's cool, but you're also fighting a lava spilling hulk while Freed herself goes mental. It's just a lot to keep track of. And Slave Knight Gale is literally the blueprint for end bosses in Elden Ring, a fight that's, again, two phases and totally jam-packed with unique animations and hard-to-dodge attacks. It feels like the only way the Souls team knows for sure to challenge people. Up the damage, increase attack counts, tighten player dodge windows, and restrict punish opportunities. I'm not saying it's bad, just very specific. And while I like these fights in retrospect, they forced me to abandon my build. I didn't fully respect, I just did the lame thing. I put down the great sword and re-equipped my old love the longsword, propped up my shield, and took no more than two attacks at any given time. I beat every one of these bosses in a single sitting afterwards. It sucked. I compromised on what I cared about and played as lame as possible. Still felt amazing after finishing Gale, I won't lie. I'm usually pretty dull on tough boss wins these days, like yeah, that should have happened three hours ago, but I was actually screaming here. I beat him! I got him! I beat him! Yeah! The takeaway is that Souls was never this strict, but it's how the design evolved going forward. I've played Sekiro and Elden Ring now, and damn, they knew they found the secret formula to creating an entire subgenre of Souls content on YouTube for cheesing boss battles. Yikes. So, how'd they cap off the final Dark Souls game? Unless you fish for a secret ending by doing a series of strange things you'd never know to do implicitly, the endings of the past games are repeated again. I have a hard time caring about the events of the game over the raw world building because that's where the fun is, mostly. And after realizing that the same set of endings is handed to the player constantly. On one hand, amazing work committing to the bit. On the other, can we please just light this f*** up already? It's old. It's tired. People have pretty spirited debates about the endings, and part of the problem inherent to Souls endings is we don't have all the information. It's just not available. For example, Dark is not the Abyss, but is related to the Abyss, I guess. It's hard then to know if linking the flame forever and heaping calamities is at all worthwhile for temporary preservation of life. If ending the flame means that someday another species will rise and have another chance of potentially doing everything on screen again. Or if usurping the flame, jacking the power for your 
yourself in more or less doing what happened at the end of 2 will lead humanity to a better place, but as we know, all ages end. The intractable problem of the Souls universe is the gods don't really serve humanity, humanity is doomed to irrelevance without the flame alongside the gods, the world seems to support inherent hierarchies, rules is written, at a baseline. It's a fun thing to talk about, but leads to the same frustrations inherent to internet atheism versus Christianity debates. Like, there's never gonna be a sufficient answer. So why are we talking about it? Fun for the banter, anyway. For now, it seems that FromSoft is fine with letting the fire fade. Between Bloodborne, Sekiro, and Elden Ring, the studio made it clear that the Dark Souls era is over. They went in, established one of the most influential new subgenres in video games, and started iterating in under a decade, spawning a whole slew of copycats. Job well done, I guess. And I'll be covering all of FromSoft's later titles, too. So until then, may your fire burn low and long until stoked slowly by fury until it sparks into a great corona and changes the world. And uh, otherwise, shields up, focus on light attacks, don't get good, get mean. The world sucks, but your story is what you make of it. Live, love, Lamau, roll the credits. Hey, it's K-Bash. Huge thanks goes out to my $4 patrons. Check them out. Beautiful. And double special thanks goes to my extra generous patrons who are... Adam Welch, Acropolis, Alex, Alpha, 42, Arch, Azura, Axin Azua, Spacement Dweller, Keep Easy Soul, Ben M, Blake Against the Machine, Boa, Boom Dead, Brios, Brianna Wu, British Gooch, Cal, Can I Cuss on Captain Here, Captain Blasted, Captain Wade, Caesar T, Chiefy Boy, Cordon, Chris Bromo, Cody Golden, Couch Mo, Corgi the Lad, Crater, CW Glass, Kyle Caprice, Cynical, Daddy Dagon, Don Dion, Denny Pango, Dakota Storm Jones, Jackie Stag, Swaggy, David Bet, Castillo, Dara, Dakota, Dead, Dennis Amaya, Diablo, Dr. Cullen P. Yes, Chabano.com. Dylan Coffee. 8 Bit Thug. Elias. Elpio. Elsa. Aesthetico. Everstone Isle. Exa. Fupa Saiyan. Frankenstein. Frisky Nippler. Glitzy Goose. 6112. Gray, the Darkest Black. Gorkori. Gucci Plant. Hatsune Miku's Crackhouse. Arkosh. Demon. Game and Station. X-Men. Horn Tiger. Huey. I'm supporting K-Bash just because I wanted to make this part of the video longer. Ingenious Clown. I punched a sandwich. Irrational. Irradiated Cherry. Dice Kyle. It's not bad. It's time to sue. It's not good. Ivy Ruth Langley. Jake Jacob, James, Jason Lasky, Jaden, Jay Dayas, JK Hedgehog, John Bo the Joker, Joke Frog, Jordan Joyner, Julian My Julian, Keegan Too Cool, Kata Snack, King Kuma, Clock Crating, Crazy Dark Chocolate, Kyle, Kyle, KZ Excellent, Lady Dentalian, Matrix, Laundry Mom, Lego Sid, Loathsome Dung Eater, Warren, Low Fat Mogul, Lucas Boyd, Lucky McSmucky, Mac James, Magical Madman, Mara Ganger, Merculus, Mars Mugio, Maximilian Wolfgang, Niver, Mike DeVere, Milky Moo Official, Monochrome Only, Mr. Dodongo, Mr. Whiskey 282, Nido Torpedo, Nico Puzzle Rain, Daridius, Not Nobel, Old Burgle, Old Man Cranberry, Only LK, The Plant, Pandemic Cowboy, Vignata, PK Gaming, Hockeyfer Hitman, Potato Gaming HD, Prismatic Dan, Crunkle and Pals, Quasar McDougal, Quillworth, Quinn, Reasonable Willow, Reggie Rodriguez, Renteca Bond, Ricochet Frame, Relay, Roy Londo, Ryan Mori Brooks, Siren Smells Good, Salty Smasher, Scribe Slendy, Sakai No Award, Shod, Silver Bear 909, Sim God! Sleepy Wabbit. Suckdologer. Space Lizard. Spooky Grimalkin. Squidget. Squishward. Starbound. Storm Strider. Sublime Cataclysm. Super Sandwich Sean Guy. Shubbing the Big Bubby. The Clown Prince of Cringe. The Green Loki. The Salt Knight. The Dick Mystic. Thrips Heart Tickles Drop. McGuffin. Timid the Writer. Turtle Play. Travis Edwards. Twiddle Chung. Ty Guy 9001. Vid. Valen Rift. Venom. Vice Puck. Viewers Like You. Vic. Waposa. Weed Trash. Wayland. Where Am I Help? Winter Solstice. Wood TV. Zanny Tanner. Yashi Chi. Kundo. Zachary lives. Zachary Z. Zanasso. Zane the Impure. Zane the Pure. Zeradax. Zed Slayer Gamer. Zero Zalazar. Silvlin Ray. Zenova. Cyberpunk. If you'd like to help support the show, unlock new long-form projects, and help me keep improving, check out my Patreon. We got lots more videos in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.